seated. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to uh, be together. Hopefully, your hearts have been encouraged and uh, uplifted to this point, and we're going to be able to spend some time now in our uh, study of uh, the Word of God. And uh, a couple of things that I wanted to um, just mention. This is our Thanksgiving Sunday. We do this once a year. I know we have uh, a good handful of guests with us today. We uh, support uh, the work of the Impact Houston Church of Christ in inner city uh, Houston. And uh, we have a long-standing relationship uh, with the congregation there and uh, helping support the work. Uh, this morning at our Bible class, we were uh, informed about many of the great things that God is doing. And uh, it's just amazing to think that we get to share in and be a part of that. Uh, and so uh, that's why this morning, Chris, uh, who led our prayer, he taught the Bible class this morning. Um, and then Jim Deloney, who is uh, known by many people here, is here uh, to be able, they're going to load the van and carry everything back to impact here after we have our, our Thanksgiving meal. And if you're here today, uh, we have a, a great meal planned afterwards. And I know sometimes people think, um, well, I didn't bring anything. Well, you're just the person that should stay. Because we have food for you, right? We have food for everybody. Don't let that be a reason. Uh, we're going to enjoy a meal together to kind of kick off the Thanksgiving season. And uh, we have a lot, definitely have a lot to be thankful for. I'm very grateful for uh, Chris uh, and Jim both for the work that they do. And, and Pat, Jim's wife, very, uh, very involved in supporting uh, the work of the church and bringing encouragement. And Chris, thank you for coming today. I uh, wanted to uh, say that. And... Um, just uh, helping us to be sure that we do not become just self-focused on our work here in Brenham. And uh, though we want to preach the gospel here in Brenham, we want to be doing ministry work here in Brenham, we, we realize that Brenham is not the center of the cosmos. Amen? Thank you. Okay. It's not. You know, and it tends to be, this is a tendency everywhere we are. Where we live tends to become, we, we sort of, that's really becomes most of all that we think about. That's natural. There's no, nothing wrong with that. But as Christians, we, we know that we stand under an authorized commission to go into all the world to make disciples. And so we intentionally go beyond our local boundary of focus. And we think about like places like inner city Houston, places like Eastern European missions. Uh, and we have the privilege of being able to help to share uh, in those works by prayer and support uh, and encouragement as well. And so today we're going to um, uh, continue in our study of the healthy church. And we, this, this will be week number three. And uh, these are sort of standalone messages. So if you miss one and two, you know, the miracle of technology, you can go back and listen to those. But if you didn't, we're, we're going to have a self-contained message today out of the book of Acts and, and, and the things that we consider. But I think um, as we talked about initially, many churches today are rebounding from it, different issues. They're rebounding from the years of COVID. As I mentioned to you before, I think uh, last year, 60,000 churches closed their doors. Uh, in our country. Uh, also, uh, in many churches, in some of the larger areas, uh, Nashville uh, being one of them, where there's a strong foothold for Bible-based, uh, Church of Christ, non-denominational, uh, still one in four members has not come back. And so, we realize that this is a, a situation that deserves attention. And it deserves attention through our intentional study of the Word of God. It doesn't deserve attention in a sense of scolding or, or, or rebuking. It deserves attention because we believe and know that our solutions are in the Word of God. Therefore, it deserves our attention. And so we want to continue today. We, uh, we looked last time, if we we'll, can go to our text slide here in Acts chapter 2. We're going to be, if you're... you're uh, We'll be in Acts chapter 2 here for a good part of our discussion today. Verse 42, uh, we find here, we'll pick up in, in, uh, in 42. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, 
and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together. They had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Let's uh, pray for a moment. Lord, we thank you that you've created a church family that we can all have a place to belong. And Father, we pray that as we study today that you will speak to our hearts far beyond the words on a page or the thoughts coming from my heart, but you will speak to each one of us individually in our hearts and in teaching us what you want us to hear and understand and know. Lord, as I present the thoughts that you placed on my heart, I pray they will minister and that through the power of your spirit will minister to each and every heart that's here. But, but far beyond that, Lord, uh, far beyond the frail and, and uh, incompetent vessel that I am, that you would work powerfully through your word. We offer all these prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, a couple things, too. Let me uh, just digress a moment. I'll be at Impact Preaching next Sunday. So uh, this will be a great follow-up to get back there. Next Sunday, I have swapped with one of the guys on the preaching team there at Impact. He will be here next Sunday preaching. Uh, and I'll encourage him not to do too good of a job. No, I'm just kidding. I'm going to encourage him to come and burn the house down. All right? And uh, Thomas... Reed will be coming and preaching next Sunday. So we're, we're sort of doing a, a pulpit swap, if you will. And uh, I know we'll look forward to, to having him here uh, for us as well. But uh, also, I wanted just to mention, I, I thank you for the prayers that you've offered for my sister. I, um, you know, I, I stood here last Sunday and told you that she had been told that there was no sign of cancer. Um, and so then found out uh, two days later that she has cancer. Uh, and that she has bladder cancer, and that there, it's, 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 the doctor has moved her pre-op to this Thursday, and then hopefully immediate surgery uh, to deal with the tumor that she's dealing with. And so, uh, just thank you. Please keep her in your prayers. I know you are, and I, I appreciate that. Uh, I did want to let you know, I, I just feel so weird to get up here last Sunday and say, she's totally clear, no sign. And then the doctor this week, as he was doing a cystoscopy, he said, and within 30 seconds, he said, oh, I see your problem here. This is it. You have cancer. Here's what we need to do. And, and then they'll know more about how to treat once they uh, are able to remove the tumor. So I, I just want to say a huge thanks. It means so much. And, and I know as we pray for each other, it's good to know that we have each other covered, you know, in prayer. And I wanted to say thank you. So the healthy church, that's what we're talking about. A healthy church means that we have healthy members. And so what we talk about in general as a healthy church falls upon each and every one of us uh, as members. And so we know on the day of Pentecost that the Holy Spirit through prophecy fell upon the apostles. Uh, the 120 were in the upper room. The apostles began to preach and teach. You remember this, this dramatic, powerful beginning to the church. You remember that about 3,000 were added to their number that day. And so this group grew from about 135 to 3,135. Not a bad start for a church planting, right? I mean, that's the kind of like growth you like to see. And so the Lord moved powerfully. And so right away, the, this newly fresh-born, spirit-filled church is, is healthy and thriving because not only were the 3,000 baptized that day, but it said the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. And so we see a church that's vibrant and healthy and growing. And as we talked about, some of the keys, that probably the four pillars of healthy churches are listed for us right here. In verse 42, it says... They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. 
These are the four pillars upon which a healthy Christian life is lived, and it's our healthy pillars upon which God's church thrives anywhere, anytime, any place. These principles guarantee health and growth. Now, it doesn't guarantee the exact same results. You know, someone asked me the other day, do I think the Brenham Church could grow to be 3,000? You know what? God can do whatever He wants to do. I'm not going to get in His way, and hopefully none of us will get in His way. But whether the church here is 300 or 3,000 or somewhere in between, it's not numbers, it's that the Lord is adding to the number those who are being saved. Not a church that's swelling in numbers by moving sheep. Not a church that's swelling in numbers by gimmicks and programs and giveaways. Not a church that's growing on self-improvement and latest cultural fads. But the Lord adding to our number daily those who are being saved, which has that life based upon the apostles' teaching the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and prayer. Last week, we talked about the apostles' teaching, the importance of being devoted, sold out, under the authority of the Word of God, committed, dedicated, never feeling like we've arrived. Oh, no. Because we always have things to learn, things that areas that we can grow in. And the minute any congregation feels that they've got everything down pat, that's the beginning of the downhill journey. And so, it takes that devotion. Now, today I want to touch on, on two areas. The uh, fellowship and the breaking of bread. I want to talk about that. Appropriate that we are uh, talking about the breaking of bread. We'll be doing that right after. We'll get to break some bread together. So, uh, and next week, by the way, for our Sunday morning Bible class, we're going to talk about fasting. So enjoy your meal today. We're going to talk about some good, Jesus-centered, biblical fasting next week. And some of you are thinking, okay, move on, will you? I can smell the food. Okay, that's fine. But hopefully that will bring you next week, you know, to uh, be able to study and get a good look at some things. But, you know, this idea of fellowship. Fellowship is an interesting word. You've, you've heard this. I, I know much of this is sort of a... Uh, things that you may have heard or studied yourself. The Greek word for fellowship is the word koinonia. Koinonia is a, is a pregnant word, okay? It is a rich, diverse, meaningful word. We do not have one competent English word that translates it. That's why it is translated five to six different ways in almost every translation you will read. You won't recognize it because it will be translated as a different word. Now, every language has these kinds of words in them. We have some of those in English. Uh, when I uh, studied Swedish and, and began conversing, you begin to realize that in every language that there are certain words when you try to translate it back into English. You describe the word by English terms, and then you say, does that really, what this five-letter word is in Swedish... Do these 17 words clearly describe this word? And you think, yeah. If you conglomerate it all, it does. And that's because every language has words that have super rich meaning. Koinonia is a word like that. We translated fellowship. We translated support. We translated uh, sharing. The, the basis, the idea behind fellowship is that we are sharing life together. You say, what part of life? Exactly. And we share all parts of life together. This is ex we see this sort of broken out and exemplified here where it says they had everything in common. Uh, it says that they sold and gave. It says every day they met together in the temple courts in large groups. And they also met together in homes in the small groups. They met together in larger groups to be instructed by the apostles. And then they would go into homes and they would eat and they would discuss and apply the things that they had heard from the apostles. And so we see this, as, this fellowship. Uh, part of it is breaking bread. We can break bread and not fellowship. That is possible, right? 
What makes breaking bread true fellowship is when we know that we are, we are spiritually led, that we are growing, that we're talking on spiritual terms. That's what makes eating together fellowship. And these are all sort of the, the idea that they were praising God and they had glad and sincere hearts. So this is something that, that God has built in and designed for His church is that we would have the kind of fellowship and relationships that would show the world, John chapter 13, 34, the whole world will know you're my disciples by the love you have for each other. And that's why God designs the church as he designs it. He designs it for our best benefit, but he also designs it as a reflection to those around who, who they may have heard the Bible, they may have grown up religious, but when they see it happening, we cannot deny when we see the love of Christ being lived out in the life of his church. And so this is a very, very important idea that we have this concept. And, and what, a couple of things I want to talk about today, and I'm going to tell you right up front, I'm going to be meddling in your business. Okay? And my business. It's our business. Okay? So, but I want to share a couple of things that I think would be, would be important for us because we have had a breakdown of fellowship and communication in our society. We've had a breakdown of communication and sharing in the church. The church has become consumerism. Come, consume, go home. It's not anything anybody sets out to do. No one wakes up one Sunday morning and says, hey, you know, I'm going to do the consumer thing. It happens due to various circumstances. But if we aren't careful, none of us is above that happening. And so you say, well, you know, it's really interesting. I, you, I was thinking about some things this week, and I'm going to try to share this. You know, we live in a world where you and I are the masters of our own universe, aren't we? If you're not, you should wake up. Somebody should tell you. You can be the master of your own universe. And you know what? That universe can all boil down to a little thing that we have in our hand or on our tablet. I told you I was going to mess. I told you, right? Why? You said, why is that? Do you know that we can control our whole world through this and we live, we live, can live in a false world? I can control who my friends are right here. And as a matter of fact, I can even gauge my popularity and my self-worth by how many friends that I have. Oh, and you know what? If you're not fitting my friend, Bill, I just got, I have a little button here for you. <laughs> Boom, gone, right? I can, you know, we, we, isn't this funny how social media has hijacked the meaning of the word friend? You can have friends that you have never once ever spoken to. You can have friends that you have, just because they asked to be one, they are one. And so that has been hijacked. When God talks about friendship, it's not controlling our own version of reality. It's the family that we're given. And, you know, uh, we even have, you get, have so many followers, right? Followers. That's what Jesus had, followers, not Twitter. Followers. You know, who, we, followers. We, Social media has hijacked so much of what good, is good and pure. And you know what's interesting? It's not social media. It's anti-social media. Because I'm doing all my socializing right here. Okay, before anybody freaks or panics, I like smartphones. I'm a technology believer, okay? So, and I try to be a forefront adapter. But that doesn't change the fact that a tool that can be used for good, suddenly, you know, we're, we're we, we, instead of talking to one another, we're texting one another. That's called a textually transmitted disease. <laughs> in case you've never been told that. Right? You know, we have... We, we, we get to the point, and, and we even find ourselves hiding behind these things. We say things on here that we would never say to another person in their face. 
We go on to our social platforms and we blast off about this and that. Why? Because I'm controlling my universe, buddy. I am in charge. And, and if you have any flack, all I do is push a button and you're gone. Now, you know what the problem with that is? When that bumps up against reality, it's an ugly reality. I can feel good about all this stuff that I'm doing. At the end of the day, this is not reality. What I'm doing here, this is not social. This is not reality. Reality is real people. Real people aren't as sweet. You know, you can even make an avatar to make yourself look better. You know, you look at that and say, oh, man, I just shave off about 10 pounds right there and make, got a little more hair than I really do. You know, you make, and so even when you're sending messages to people, it's not even the real you picture we're sending. Are you following me here? And so what can happen is, even in the church, we get used to this kind of media and tell me, if I have spent a year, two years, three years sculpting my perfect world, then tell me something. Why do I want to rub shoulders and bump into a bunch of just ordinary people? Because ordinary people, you can't push a button and get rid of them. I know some of you wish you could. And stop looking around. You know, you can't do that. If you, if you have a, a run-in with someone, you actually have to work it out. You can't mute them. There has to be discussion. That's what sharing and fellowship is about. You talk about the people who should know the most about reality and self-actualization and authenticity is the follower of Jesus Christ, not someone who hides behind a screen and creates a world. I'm talking about someone who's in the world, meeting people, sharing with them, showing love. Whatever may come, we, we do it for Jesus. That's reality. And my fear is that so much of this has, been, has seeped into the church without us even recognize it, that we can find ourselves just adopting the culture. And believe me, one of the greatest downfalls of Christianity in America today is, for so long, we have tried to tell people in the world, you know what? We're going to create the church like your culture, and we're going to, so you can come in and be comfortable. You know, Hollywood, oh, well, oh, Hollywood's bad, but you know what? We'll create our own Christian Hollywood, and then you'll be okay. Rock idols and music idols, oh, oh, forget, they're terrible. Oh, but come on over here. We got a lot of music idols for you over here. They just, you know, change them what they're singing about. But we're lifting up, and we're adopting. What's happening is people become consumerized. They choose churches on what they want. They're not thinking about what does God want. They're like, do I like it here? Was that song good? Was that prayer okay? Was that person nice to me? That's what they're thinking. This is self-centered consumerism Christianity, which is destined to fail. And we can brew up gimmicks and popular things that bring in crowds. But tell me, if that's how you've been living your life, why would anyone want to hear Luke 9, 23, where Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself. If we've been told it's all about me, and I can go to church where people say, oh, follow Jesus and you'll be blessed. You'll never be sick. You'll always be good. He's going to promote you. It's going to be awesome. Sun's always shining. Why would I want to come to a church where we talk about discipleship. Jesus said, if you want to come after me, you've got to deny yourself and take up your cross. That's so ugly. It's so inconvenient. It's so self-inconveniencing. Why would, would anybody even want to be a part of that? And sometimes we wonder. And that's why it's important that in a healthy church that we strike a clear message. The clear message isn't, we're going to create a culture that everybody's going to love, so come on in. We're going to make the music so awesome, you know, uh, that, that you're just going to be so wild, you're going to fall over and think, this is the place to be. And I know, you know, when it comes to the preaching, 
There's no hope somebody's going to get preached to make you go, this is the place where I want to be. We need to stay in the Word of God, stay focused on Jesus. We need to share our lives like real people, not go hide off in the corner creating some perfect world that will never exist until we get to heaven. We got to love each other. We got to get to know each other. We're a diverse group. Uh, you know, we, we have people here from all kinds of backgrounds, but it's still easy to come to church and hide and not make any effort to get to know people. But that's what real fellowship is. That's why it's so important that you and I realize, you know, um, I, I read the article this week on, and, and I just, I'm going to tell you something again you already know. Loneliness accelerates the aging process drastically. It says here that the feeling of hopelessness, being unhappy, lonely, uh, displays a connection to a patient's biological age, which is more harmful than the impact of smoking. Loneliness. Why does God create a church with fellowship? Because it meets our deepest need of a place to belong. We all need a place to belong. We need a place to go where we feel like somebody's got my back. We need to go somewhere where we feel like, hey, I got brothers, I have sisters, and I have you. I got you covered. I'll pray for you. I will serve you. There is devotion that goes beyond what worldly friendship can provide. And isn't it interesting that God designed something that meets our deepest, most inner needs and then displays his glory to the world? Because when we enter into a room where we know there's real fellowship going on, we sense the presence of God. And that's open to all of us, every single one of us. No one, this is not just open to extroverts or introverts or other verts, uh, you know. Sometimes people think, well, if I'm going to be a Christian, I've got to have a certain personality. Look, you have your personality. God gave you your personality. He will enhance the personality that he gave you, but you don't have to have any certain personality type to have great fellowship. Because this God in his spirit and in his love, he designs this beautiful thing for all of us to meet the very deepest needs that we have. You know, this is something as we think about a healthy church. There's, there's a whole lot more to this, but it just was so, just struck me so much that this is how much God loves us, that he gives us this place to belong. Chris in class this morning was talking about some different people at Impact who all their life had been looking for a, a group to belong to. They couldn't find, people didn't like them for who they were. I'm thankful they can come to a place like Impact and feel like they belong. Not just they're tolerated, they belong. Our family here in Brenham, our church family, I hope as these doors swing open, whatever meeting we're having a part of, that anybody coming through the door sees and senses God's presence in a way that they feel, I know I could belong here if I want to. That's what fellowship does. It reverberates. Now, when we talk about the breaking of bread, he says, you know, breaking of bread is pretty, this is pretty straightforward. You know, um, communion, we, we didn't really break bread this morning. We flipped the pop top and had the wafer. But the communion service together is part of what the early church did. That's, some people say, why do you do this every, every Sunday? Well, we do it every Sunday because it was a pattern in the New Testament church. And when we come together, what better thing to do with our time than to remember Jesus. That's something you and I get to do. It's this, it's Siri. We, it's not just something that we do for a religious exercise. We take communion and then check the box. I did it. We, we actually participate in communion. And when I'm done, I really should know I participated in communion. I don't know what you did. I don't know what was in your heart or in your mind, but I participated in communion. That's the privilege that we share when we come together and we take communion. The breaking of bread, having food together. You know, um, when I was in, in the process of leaving Grace Crossing and coming to Impact, I was talking to the elders uh, at, at Impact, and Paul Woodward, many of you know him, great brother, and 
and just a delightful friend. But I, before I got to know him very well, he would say to me, well, Tim, you know what? I, I'm really, it'd be so awesome if this can work out. Let's get, let's get some food. I'm thinking. He's like, I, I got the garage sale this weekend, but let's meet in a couple weeks and let's get some food and let's talk. And I'm thinking, get some food. Who needs food, right? So finally, when we got food, what I realized is he wanted to break bread. Sit across a table and talk. Get to know me. Spend time asking things. You know, when you sit down with someone and you're still enough, long enough to eat, you know, you learn things about people. You ask things. You learn things about them that you just never know. And you relearn things that you, oops, you know, you had learned before. But the sitting still and having a meal together says, I trust you. You know, when we have our, when we have our meals following, you know, you know what that says when we all come together? Oh, I mean, it says, okay, we're blessed and we're thankful. But it says, we trust each other. That's what that says. Because I'm, I'm going to be in the room with you, and we're going to be eating food, and we're going to be sharing things, and we're, and we're going to be talking. Whether we happen to bump into each other personally or not, it makes a statement that says, this is family, and we're all here. When I, when I grew up, when family met, I didn't really hadn't have an option. <laughs> it was family time. We all got together, and that was just assumed we were all there. You can't choose your family. The breaking of bread brings a healthy church. So today, we're going to, um, we're going to sing a song of decision here. But, and we're going to continue on this theme of healthy church. But today, when we think about fellowship, think about who you are and where you're at in your sharing your life with other people. Encouraging those around you. Not waiting passively to take a step back, but stepping forward and, and, and being involved, being open, having a spirit of humility. And the breaking of bread together, let's be thankful for all that we have. We are such a blessed country, and in spite of our inflation and everything else, no one looks like they're missing any meals. Let, let's, just, let's just put it right out there, right? We should be so grateful for all the things we have. And so today as we stand and sing, if you have a special need, prayer request that you didn't get a chance to put on the prayer card or whatever, we ask you to come forward as we stand together and sing.